Hello, and thank you for joining us today. We have over 600 people signed up to attend, and that's incredible. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Golna Aref. I'm a uh, NIHR Academic Clinical Fellow in Psychiatry, and I also work in Camden and Islington, NHS Foundation Trust. Now, in um, March 2020, our acute mental health admissions ward was converted almost overnight into the COVID-19 ward for our trust. We lost most of our regular nursing staff and our handy foundation year doctors, but our team were flexible in their thinking, positive in their approach and had the most incredible sense of camaraderie. And I really believe these were the key factors that allowed us to successfully run a hybrid ward. I'm really delighted to chair the presentations, and today we have the two consultants, a higher trainee and the core trainee from the team, and that really led our ward to this successful transition. Um, we will hear from them each in turn, and then there'll be an opportunity at the end for questions. Um, but please do submit your questions throughout the webinar using um, the Q&A panel. If you have more general questions, please, um, find a link which is in the Q&A panel which will go towards the policy team. Um, please do tweet throughout the event using um, hashtag RCPsychLive um, if you're on Twitter or any other social media. Um, I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker today who is the senior consultant from our ward, um, Dr Janet Obeni williams um, when the respiratory nurse from the medical hospital came to teach the mental health ward, our ward, how to assess and treat COVID-19, there was apprehension in the room. Um, we are a unit who are comfortable dealing with sort of psychosis, mania, aggression, but anyone with sort of complex physical health problems are transferred and treated in a, um, in a medical hospital. Um, the nurse, then explained in detail how full the acute medical hospital was becoming and that we, a psychiatric unit, were likely to have to manage and palliate patients. She finished by saying that the death from COVID-19 was like watching someone drown, and that the only thing that eases the suffering is morphine. At this point, you could almost taste the fear in the room, with the exception of Janet, who broke the unease by saying, well, we'd better get some morphine in then. The atmosphere immediately changed in the room from fear to can do, and that's Janet through and through. So I'm pleased to hand over now to our fearless leader and COVID-19 slayer, Dr. Janet Obeni williams Thank you, Golna. That's uh, uh, a very fine introduction and um, Thank you for naming really the most important thing that uh, we want to, uh, if we want to say celebrate or to highlight is the, the camaraderie and the teamwork in our team. So I'm just going to do a short introduction um, on what we were trying to achieve once this uh, change began. Next slide, please. So uh, to get a little more specific, I'm sure most of you now remember the date March the 11th, 2020, when COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic and, and many of us, I guess medics in particular, had been following the media, scientific and uh, general, to see when, when, this, you know, when we were going to go into this zone. So there was no surprise, it was uh, still really uh, laying down a marker in that things were going to change in the healthcare we were going to deliver. Um, as Skolner has uh, rightly said, we're from an acute triage ward and we uh, primarily manage mental health difficulties. And we are going to tell you through um, some descriptions and answering your questions exactly how we went about it and what we did. So the, the next slide, please. So we had, um, I can say, amazing um, foresight and help from our executive managers, medical and non-medical, who already had thought way ahead of us, the clinicians, um, that this facility would be needed. And um, it became very uh, 
very very early on in the changes we started to make it was very clear that we in our triage ward were going to become a ward where we could isolate uh, stabilize either with mental health or physical health and medically manage the mental health inpatients who had uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and like many of you who work in uh, both frontline and community services you'll all be recalling the times in March when we were trying to safely discharge the patients that we all had in hospitals to uh, keep them safe from the perspective of the pandemic and to create capacity for uh, new admissions. So we uh, started with um, a ward that was safely em emptied and we were embarking on trying to do three things really. Um, look after these patients, deal safely with them if they deteriorated in their physical health, but that they didn't meet the threshold for admission to an acute medical ward. So patients whose uh, uh, mental health needs dictated them being in hospital or gave them fewer resources to deal with what many people would be able to deal with at home. And we wanted to provide a safe isolation place for them in the lockdown and provide um, a, as good a care as we could. So we were aiming to provide an enhanced level of physical health care beyond what we'd normally provide for every patient in our mental health ward. Although, clearly within the team skill range and also and i think this was great foresight really from our um the, the people who manage our trust we wanted to limit transition within our mental health unit so that we could not uh, become a source of a, a a mini pandemic within a pandemic so those were the aims um, next slide please so the methods really um I'd describe it in a, in a when, when I read the slides they sound fairly dry but it, it was it was a, a very rapid process and we were uh, dealing with a ward where we had a brand new uh, a brand new team with some of the same personnel and, and and different personnel because understandably there were some people who who uh, couldn't work in our ward for for whatever reason shielding or or um, having to not be exposed to the virus. So we started off with a very fixed and predictable daily routine to have a re, uh, continuity but for both the new staff group and also for the patients as they came in. So it's really meant just um, having a safety huddle. We've gone from being an acute triage ward to being a medical ward with people with mental health needs, but we still have a safety huddle every day. We very quickly repurposed our pro forma and that's really down to my uh, junior doctor colleagues, the very able SPRs, and the CTs who immediately repurposed our, our screening tool for the kinds of uh, assessments we wanted to make every day and also to screen as a screening tool for admissions on our ward. Um, we made also a very clear um, decision straight away that we would review every patient every day, the doctors uh, plus the nurses, but the doctors would see everybody every day. And we had uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time uh, well a lot of time was spent sourcing detail right from um, those disposable tourniquets which are everywhere now and they weren't at the start uh, the water jugs the prompting of patients all very basic things and um, I think the person who hasn't been uh, mentioned on this we have a, a very great procuring housekeeper who's really central to repurposing our ward very quickly and also starting to, to think alongside our clinical colleagues in the acute trust, ourselves and our executive medical leads, how to safely um, ensure oxygen supplies on the ward and also um, within ourselves as a medical and nursing group, how to absolutely clarify thresholds of oxygen treatment that we could safely provide on our ward. So lots and lots of everyday ordering and getting everything together really in the first few days. Next slide, please. I think I, I've said it really, but it, it, it's the, the, I, I can't stress enough the, the, the leadership from above, the uh, the acquisition of whatever we needed, whether it's the scrubs, the PPE, the, um, the lots more stethoscopes than we normally have, lots more um, phlebotomy equipment. Um, eventually, through the our local acute trust and our, our physical health nursing leads, we acquired oxygen concentrators and to myself as a as an ex-gp 
the idea that we could acquire oxygen concentrators for particular situations, not for named patients, was incredible. And there was redeployment of the staff from other wards or um, from the community as well, some matrons with enhanced physical skills to our nursing team. So really, I've just I've just opened up what the, my colleagues, Mel and the other doctors are going to tell you uh, the detail about how we manage this. And as I was watching on television, the uh, setting up of the Nightingale Hospital, uh, I, we were going through a mini version of this quickly in a military manner, acquiring everything and getting ready. I think that's me, that's my last slide. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Janet. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Melanie Knowles. She's a psychiatry hire trainee in the North London Training Programme, and she specialises in general adult and old age psychiatry. And she has been working in the acute admission ward for the past 10 months, um, where she's actually renowned for not only her incredible clinical skills, but also making the most uh, delicious chocolate Guinness cake. So I'm going to now hand over to Dr. Melanie Knowles, or as we like to call her, Nigella Lawson. Thank you, Golna, for that introduction. I don't think I was quite prepared for all of that. Um, so as this slide says, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the clinical management of our patients, so the management of COVID-19 specific to our patients' mental health needs. Um, I'm also going to talk about liaising with the Acute Medical Trust, and then a little bit on staff well-being as well. So next slide, please. So generally on our ward, there were, there were three main groups of patients. Um, there were those who were very well with COVID-19, who maybe had a cough or an isolated fever, or who later maybe were asymptomatic, uh, and also who were quite stable in their mental health. So able to, to self-isolate in their rooms, usually with capacity to do so. Um, I mean, obviously there were still challenges for this group of people. It's challenging to, to stay by yourself in a, in a small room for a week. It would be hard for any of us. And they were still seen every day. Uh, and the various measures used for the more agitated patients were, were also very helpful for them, such as tailored OT activity packs. The next group were, were people with a, a um, mild form of the physical illness, but due to, to agitation or acute mental illness had real difficulties managing self-isolation. And then the third group were those who were acutely medically unwell due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So for the, for the individuals who were maybe agitated, acutely unwell, confused, or, or not really able to, to understand and consent to the, the need for isolation, they had quite intensive psychiatric input, I suppose. Um, they were still seen daily. They still had uh, four times daily physical health OBS checking in case things did deteriorate. Uh, we, we were given tailored OT activity packs by our occupational therapy team. Uh, we also had iPads, which proved among the most helpful uh, items, actually. Uh, and it says further down, people were really encouraged to use Attend Anywhere to, um, to contact their families. And for some individuals, that proved to be the single most helpful thing in, uh, in keeping them calm and settled. Uh, often one-to-one -one nursing was required um, in the room or else, you know, outside the room, social distancing, but trying to engage people in a sort of conversational, relational way and, and try and help them stay calm. Um, E-cigarettes, uh, it seems like a simple, obvious thing, but actually it was something we realised very quickly would need to be sorted out for people who, who wanted to smoke, who, who couldn't smoke on the ward, obviously, and who couldn't understand the reasons for this. Um, we did optimise people's medication and sedation uh, to try and, I suppose, to try and try and improve their mental state as quickly as we could uh, and make it easier for them to tolerate being in isolation. And for those people who really couldn't tolerate isolation, who were putting themselves and other people at risk, they, they, some people were transferred to, to a PICU ward, a psychiatric intensive care ward, as they would be in normal circumstances. Next slide, please. So the third group of, of individuals were those with, an, uh, with more severe physical health symptoms. And I suppose that's the group that we were all thinking of initially when we were told that we were going to be a COVID-19 isolation ward. Um, we've been very lucky in having close ties with our neighboring acute medical trust. I think that's partly geography because they happen to be uh, just across the road to us. Um, but also we, we had strong ties because the consultants there 
conduct quite a lot of outreach clinics to our patients for things like diabetes or COPD. So they had a really good understanding of what a mental health hospital is like, uh, of our facilities and of our client groups and the particular challenges that they might face specifically. Uh, so communication was key from the very beginning. Next slide, please. So we had quite early virtual conferences, uh, particularly with the respiratory team at the Acute Trust. Um, I suppose it's easy to forget now, although it's only a few months, it's, it's easy to forget what a, what a novel virus this was and how little we knew about what to expect. We knew people became unwell, but the sort of the ins and outs of the clinical course of the virus were really unknown. Um, and the medical team at the, at the neighbouring trust had, had this exposure earlier than we did, and so they were able to feed back specific advice to us. And this was what really informed our performer that, that Janet mentioned earlier. Um, so they flagged up the priorities of treatment, uh, the possible pitfalls, so things again that we all know now but that we didn't know at the beginning, such as the, the need for really robust VTE prophylaxis, uh, the high risk of renal failure, and then also protocols such as antibiotic cover, when to use it, when not to use it, um, and then patient risk factors. Again, we know it now, but we didn't know it at the time, that people with diabetes were at so much higher risk. Uh, we, didn't, we, we assumed that people who smoked would have a worse outcome, but, and we now know that to be the case. Uh, and then other risk factors such as um, particularly patients from a black uh, and ethnic minority background. So those all informed our performer. And they were things that were flagged up each day that we, we sort of checked off almost as a, almost as a checklist uh, to make sure that we didn't miss anything with these individuals. Um, Dr Williams mentioned that we began to discuss oxygen and we discussed palliative management very early on as well. Um, I suppose it's a good point to say that the decision was made quite early that anyone who was particularly elderly, frail or who had cognitive impairment would be best cared for probably on an older adults ward where there was more specialist input. So if those wards had their own COVID corridors and our ward dealt mainly with general adults, younger adults and people without cognitive impairment. We also had some teaching as Golna mentioned from the respiratory nurse specialist on oxygen. Um, she came with, with every oxygen device imaginable actually, but that helped us really consolidate what we would do, what our thresholds were, what we could and couldn't provide safely. Um, and Gull has mentioned the anxiety that was in the room during that talk. And I'm going to come to that a little bit later when I talk about staff wellbeing. Next slide, please. So these acutely medically unwell people uh, were seen daily, as was everyone. Um, and they also had their, their news, their physical health observations checked much more frequently than the other patients, used often hourly or even more frequently than that. They had more intensive nursing, again, often on a one-to-one. -one. Um, and there was quite a lot of ongoing dialogue with the medical teams about them. Uh, we also did provide oxygen for these people of up to, up to four litres a minute. But again, there was sort of a lot of discussions about what the thresholds were uh, and, and what we could and couldn't treat safely on our ward. And there were some patients, several patients, who actually moved very frequently from our ward to the medical wards and back again. Because um, again, as, as I'm sure a lot of people know now, COVID-19 can fluctuate, people can seem to be recovering and then there can be another dip. So we saw that really as, as, as a positive that we were able to flexibly move people to and fro. Uh, and I've said collaborative management. Uh, I'm sure we've all had experience sometimes of there being disagreements or tension about transfer of patients, but that, that really wasn't the case in this situation. Uh, we agreed thresholds and, um, and people were transferred very flexibly. Next slide, please. So moving on to staffing, I mean, a lot of these issues will be universal. We're, we're aware of that. You know, there, were, there have been staff shortages across the NHS and across other key worker services due to people needing to shield, people being unwell, people having symptoms or having to safeguard vulnerable family members. Um, but what this meant was that, that, as Janet said, we were forming a new team almost from scratch. Um, and that brought with it its own challenges, also its own opportunities. Um, a matron was assigned specifically to our ward um, and then we also did recruit some community nurses who had really quite specialist physical health training and that proved extremely helpful. Uh, I've mentioned domestic staff shortages here, especially at the beginning, again for similar reasons, just an acute shortage of staff 
throughout. Um, and there was one memorable day when the matron and consultant and various other members of the, of the medical and nursing team actually cleaned the ward ourselves from, from top to bottom. Uh, Janet has mentioned the other roles uh, and she, she did mention the housekeeper. Um, he did prove invaluable. I think sometimes it's only in situations like this that you realise how much particular individuals do. So anything from PPE to e-cigarettes to new batteries, he, he, he could provide and he seemed to not leave the hospital for about three months. Uh, next slide, please. So I've said here a, a change of role, um, and I know this has been mentioned and is fairly obvious, but I think it's worth emphasising. We went from an acute assessment ward, acute assessment psychiatric ward, to managing medical symptoms and to managing isolation of COVID-19 patients uh, pretty much overnight. Um, and mental health nurses were now caring for medically unwell people. Now, I, I've said nurses, I mean, obviously there were, there were challenges for all of us. I think as doctors, at least we, all have some acute medical experience, uh, sometimes a while ago, sometimes quite recently. Um, and as Janet said, she's, she's from a, a primary care GP background uh, and our other consultant has quite a lot of medical experience as well. Uh, but mental health nurses often do only have the six week period of physical health training. So I think the anxiety around this really can't be um, overstated. Um, but it did provide an opportunity as well. So nurse, the nursing team commented at the end that they actually felt much more comfortable in managing physically unwell people, in making decisions about how to escalate, when to escalate, um, in, in oxygen management, and we also provided phlebotomy training. Um, and it's worth saying here as well that we, we did manage some quite unwell people. Now, at the beginning, we really didn't know whether the, the medical wards locally would be overwhelmed and, and flooded as we saw in parts of Italy. So we didn't know whether we would actually be managing very unwell people. Now, the patients that we managed were, when they reached a certain threshold, they did go across to the neighbouring hospital, which wasn't overwhelmed. But we were still tolerating quite high news scores, quite low saturations, um, and it was a very steep learning curve for the doctors and the nurses. Next slide, please. So staff welfare, I mean, stating the obvious, but we, it's again very easy to forget, I think, a few months in just how acute the anxiety was nationally, internationally, the huge amount of personal fear, understandably, that, that everyone had, um, whether it was fear for themselves, fear for loved ones, not knowing where this was going to end, when it was going to end. And then alongside that, we had managing acute medical illness, as I've said, mental health nurses managing medically unwell people, trying to limit the transmission of the virus between potentially quite agitated and mentally unwell people. Uh, we had the rapidly evolving national guidelines. I'm sure we all remember that it, it really felt like things were updated hourly sometimes, and you'd, you'd sit and have the same meeting again and again. Uh, that was necessary because things kept changing. So all of this contributed to really, really high levels of staff stress. And I'm, I'm sure this was universal, but this is particularly about our experience on Sapphire Ward. Next slide, please. So some of the things we did to, to try and combat some of the stress. I mean, I think time itself was very helpful. Um, the anxiety at the beginning did gradually settle and, and some of the nursing fee feedback uh, indicates that. I'm gonna show a couple of slides in a minute. Um, we did try to be very flexible. There was a sense of, of mucking in. Um, so the nurses in particular found that PPE and isolating patients took up a huge amount of time. Just doing the morning medication round took hours and hours when normally it would take far less. Um, so we ended up sharing quite a lot of the nursing jobs uh, between us as doctors and nurses to try and make sure that one group wasn't particularly overwhelmed. We had a structured day, as Janet said, and structured reviews. Um, Keeping it simple and keeping the daily routine predictable was really, really vital in settling that anxiety because even if people didn't know what to expect clinically, they knew what the day would look like. Um, Janet mentioned the safety huddle. So this is something that the ward's been, been doing for, for quite a while now. It's part of the Safe Wards initiative. And it's basically just a, a brief 10 minute morning meeting where staff can introduce themselves, state if they feel safe or not, and air any particular anxieties either about patients or themselves. So that provided a, a space each day to air concerns, which was really helpful. And also it provided very quick troubleshooting. So even little things such as someone saying, actually, this, this meeting time doesn't work because medication takes so long. We said, fine, we'll, we'll change it. So it provided very rapid sort of 
flexible, altering each day how we did things. And then we had a weekly reflective group, which was led by one of the senior psychologists. Um, it was voluntary, but I think everyone who was available on the ward did attend. And it provided a space each day to air concerns and to think a bit more about the emotional impact that this work was having on everyone. Um, so it allowed people to, to normalize and validate the, the stress that they were feeling and to share coping mechanisms. Um, and for me, at least, I think it was it was during these sessions that I really realized the, the burden that some people were under and the immense personal sacrifices that some people were making, people who hadn't seen their families for weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I won't read all of these out. This is just some feedback from some of the nursing team uh, about how they felt at the beginning um, and then how they felt later on. So people saying they, they felt completely overwhelmed, frightened of catching the virus, frightened of looking after sick people, so much uncertainty. And um, again, things like PPE, it's second nature now. We know what we need to wear. We know how to put it on. We know how to change. Um, all of that was unknown at the beginning and everything took a vast amount of time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but then some people said, uh, and this was the general consensus actually, that, that as, as things progressed, Sapphire Bar Ward actually became or felt a, a safer place to be because we knew that our patients had it or were presumed to have it. Have it. Dom's going to talk in a minute about testing, but, but all of our patients were presumed positive. And therefore we had these really clear protocols for them. We knew that everyone was meant to be isolating. Uh, someone said that as time passed, I think my anxiety just fell gradually and it became a new normal. Uh, and people have talked as well about how helpful the reflective group was for them uh, and also how close they felt to people that they've worked with through this. So I think that is my last slide. Uh, and next up we have Dominic, who's going to talk a little bit about testing and then also a couple of case studies. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, one of the things actually I was reflecting back on that was a real uh, facilitator was actually we uh, crowdfunded to get a bean to cup coffee machine and um, on our ward. And I, that was a real, I mean, incredible <laughs> life changer. And I would thoroughly recommend all inpatient facilities and community teams consider crowdfunding to get one. I can send you a link for the one we got. Um, the next uh, speaker is Dominic Aubrey Jones. He's a doctor who's currently in his second post. And he's actually famous throughout our trust because he uh, successfully resuscitated, say, resuscitated a patient who was having a cardiac arrest. Um, he is also one of the founding members of the COVID-19 outreach team. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Aubrey Jones. Thanks very much, Gordon. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about a couple of case studies to sort of um, bring to life what um, Janet and Mel have already um, already touched on in terms of the changes that we made to our ward. Um, and then after that, I'll talk a bit about um, testing and specifically the COVID outreach um, team that we set up. Um, next slide, please. So um, the first patient um, fits into one of those categories that Mel was talking about earlier. Um, this was um, a lady in her 50s. Um, she um, was from a black and minority ethnic background, um, which we know puts people at higher risk of um, poor outcomes with COVID-19. Um, she had a psychotic disorder um, for which she'd been admitted um, in February. Um, and in terms of her mental state, she'd actually improved quite a lot before coming um, onto our ward. Um, she also had type 2 diabetes um, and obesity. Um, so she was transferred to our ward because she developed a cough. Um, this was before we were able to test um, as a mental health trust. Um, but she became quite unwell um, intermittently. Um, she became quite tachycardic, she desaturated, her respiratory rate went up um, and a number of times she had to go to and from the local acute trust um, for medical input. Um, she never had to um, go as high as ITU in terms of care there. Um, I believe they just um, sort of gave her more supplementary oxygen, kept an eye on her and then once she'd um, improved sent her back again. Um, 
one of the challenges um, with this patient was um, her nutritional status. She became quite frail, really, while she was with us. Um, and at one stage, we were quite worried that she wasn't really able to feed herself. Um, so that was um, definitely a new set of skills for, um, for the nurses on our ward, who are normally used to looking after very fit and able people in their 20s, 30s, um, who obviously are independent of their ADLs. Um, the other thing was that um, she became far less mobile um, after having spent so long um, in, in a hospital bed. And we actually had to get um, a hospital style bed um, into our ward that we, we rented um, to enable sort of medical nursing of her. Um, so th there were some scary moments with this patient. We wondered if she might not make it, to be honest. Um, but when, when we were finally able to discharge her from the ward, um, we applauded her as, as she left, like we'd seen other, other places do on social media. And um, yeah, we, she'd just done, she'd done so well. Um, and, um, and we, were, we were really pleased to have sort of gone on this journey with her and we'd, we'd got to know her quite well. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next patient um, sort of fits uh, a demographic at the other, the other extreme of, of what we were dealing with on our ward. Um, this was a young gentleman in his 20s. Um, he'd come in with a first episode of psychosis a few months ago. Um, and he also developed a dry cough on his treatment ward. Um, we actually knew him from before because he, because we're the assessment ward. Um, we already had that relationship with him, which I think probably helped. Um, again, this was before we were able to test anyone. Um, so he never actually had a confirmed swab. Um, and he didn't have any past medical history, normally very fit and well. Um, so the challenge for him really was, was behavioral. Um, trying to keep him to stay in his room um, to prevent the spread of the virus to staff members and potentially other patients who um, we might have suspected had COVID-19, but if it wasn't confirmed, there was that risk of transmission between the two patients. Um, so we had to use some of the strategies that Mel was talking about earlier. The iPad was, was a lifesaver. Um, we were able to keep him occupied in his room with that. Um, watching YouTube, things like that. Um, and the other thing was um, him having regular phone calls with his family. Um, so we, ha we had a plan in place that if he, if he left his room, um, we would encourage him to go back um, to his room. And um, if that was a challenge and it looked like we weren't going to be able to manage with that, um, we would call his, his, uh, his family up and get him to have a conversation with them. They'd reassure him, tell him everything was fine, but explain that he needed to stay in his room. And so um, his, his family were, were really helpful in that. Um, so he stayed for his seven days of isolation, just as anyone would do at home, isolating in their own home, um, and then went back to a treatment ward. And, and we never had any incidents with him. No physical restraint had to be used. So um, another success, really. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, as I've already mentioned, at, at first, during the pandemic, we weren't able to swab anyone, which had its challenges. We, we had to treat people based on, on their symptoms. Um, but once testing uh, capacity increased, um, we were able to test people who were symptomatic. And that led us to be able to develop a pathway, which um, I'll, I'll touch on later. Um, but we also were very aware that there were some wards where we'd had maybe three out of 16 patients um, had come onto our ward um, with confirmed COVID-19. And so there was the risk that they might have spread the disease to other patients on that ward. Um, and maybe those other patients were asymptomatic or not reporting their symptoms due to their mental state. Um, so we developed the COVID outreach team. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so I've already touched on that. Not all COVID infections are symptomatic. Um, and also we identified that um, in a mental health unit, um, a lot of our patients are at higher risk of catching um, coronavirus because maybe they have got poor self-care, maybe they're more disinhibited, um, not able to socially distance um, as well out in the community. Um, so possibly more likely to pick it up. Um, 
we'd become quite practiced at swabbing in on our ward, but um, the other wards, the treatment wards, they weren't um, as confident with it. So that was um, part of the rationale behind setting up this team. Um, next slide, please. So the plan was um, that we would go around to all the different wards um, and swab asymptomatic patients. Um, some of them had um, already been with us, um, having had confirmed um, COVID-19 before. We still offered them a swab because um, we weren't at that stage sure whether it was possible to catch the virus again. And to be honest, this to see, it still seems like there's a bit of a, a question mark over that. Um, and then we as a team would chase the results up um, and let the wards know if anyone was positive so that then they could be brought down onto our ward for um, isolation and enhanced physical monitoring. Um, one of the other roles of the team was to train staff on the other wards how to swab so that um, going forward all new admissions could be swabbed for COVID-19 when they arrived um, to make sure that we weren't um, introducing it from, from the community onto our wards. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a few challenges um, with swabbing in general and also particularly with um, the COVID outreach team. Um, one of the things was the false negatives. Um, I've heard this can be as high as 30%. Um, and so there was the risk that we could have swabbed someone who was symptomatic um, we got a negative swab result and then we let the patient um, go around on, on the ward mixing interacting with all the other patients and staff and, and passing it on to them um, so we in the end we took a pragmatic approach we decided that um, if someone was asymptomatic and had a negative swab then you know we would take that as, as read that that they were negative um, if clinically they had COVID, then we would um, treat them as though they had COVID and consider doing a second swab. If the second swab was then negative, then we would um, you know, consider other causes um, of the symptoms that they were displaying. Um, one of the other issues with, um, with COVID outreach uh, was patients declining swabs. Um, interestingly, this was quite varied depending on the ward. Um, and we identified that um, on some of the wards, um, the consultants were um, more familiar with, um, with uh, what we were doing with COVID outreach, um, and they'd already prepared the patients on their wards when they saw them in their, in their care planning meetings, um, so that they'd already they'd sort of done it in a relational way. They already knew the patient and they had explained the the need for swabbing everybody rather than just a bunch of strangers from a different ward turning up and and saying that we need to you know stick a cotton bud in your nose um so um once the consultants on on the other wards were on board with what we were doing that, that improved the the take up of the swabbing one of the other issues was um delays with test results um and after a while, we sort of took this up with, um, with the hospital that we were sending the swabs to um, because it seemed quite variable. Some were coming back within a day, others were taking quite a few more days um, to come back. And, and we were told that, um, that some of the swabs are done in-house, but because of the number of um, swabs that are having to be processed, um, some of them are going to external laboratories and this is, is taking longer to process um, because of transport and just logistical issues. Uh, next slide please. So um, going forward now in terms of um, in terms of the swabbing process um, we've trained all of the wards to um, perform their own swabs so um, when new admissions come in they're, they're swabbed um, automatically and then the medical team on that ward um, chases up the result. Um, while we wait for the result in that 24-48 hour window, um, the patients are to isolate in their rooms um, just until we, we get that result. Um, and now we've got a, a clear protocol in place for how to manage people with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. So that if we do experience a second wave, which obviously we all hope doesn't happen, um, we're more prepared for, for how to manage this whole process. Um, next slide, please. 
So I think this is my last slide. Um, it's quite small, but I think the, um, the slides are going to be available for people to download afterwards. Um, essentially, this is the pathway that we developed um, that I've been talking you through um, about whether or not if they've got symptoms, then even if we haven't got a positive swab, we treat them as though they've got coronavirus um, until that swab result is back. Um, a lot of it's common sense, to be honest, um, but feel free to, um, to, to steal this, this uh, protocol um, for your trust if, if you want to. Um, that's all of my slides. Um, so if we could go back to Golna, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, definitely mentioned by both Dom and Mel is the uh, Attend Anywhere, the platform we use for video conferencing. It has been instrumental, especially because we don't have visitors and um, we're managing people who are acutely psychotic or, you know, just in time terms of how the level of crisis is to have somebody on hand from their family at any time um, and I would really encourage people who um, if you haven't sorted out sort of, uh, video conferencing is to get in touch with either myself or our CCIO the sort of uh, communications officer who and um, Dr Lorene Hanna she's been really progressive in getting this video conferencing available throughout our trust and it's so easy to use once you've got it established um, so the next and final speaker is uh, Dr. Senem Tugrul. She's actually a consultant, general adult and rehabilitation psychiatrist here. She works on both our acute admissions ward and also at the place of safety where we assess um, Section 136s and people in crisis. Um, she's a medical educator, a budding forensic psychotherapist and was actually due to get married in Turkey this week. Um, but because of COVID-19, we are so delighted that she can be here today instead. I'm not sure how she feels, but I'm sure she's delighted too. Um, please welcome for the final presentation, um, Dr. Senem Chagrel. Hello. Um, I'm going to be very brief to allow for questions, but I just wanted to mention our new unit, which is the health-based place of safety, uh, and how, as a very new team. Um, it had only been in place for six weeks before the COVID pandemic um, set in. We had to adapt to our new ways of working. Um, and what we did there, um, just to hope, in the hope that it can be of help and guidance for other places. So um, this is basically a unit that assesses specifically patients detained under the section 135 and 136. Um, it had only been open for about six weeks with an entirely new team um, that was learning to do these assessments, to uh, learn to deal with the police and the local um, LAS, uh, London Ambulance Service. Um, and again, with quite minimum training in the physical health of looking after patients. Um, initially, um, this is a place that has five rooms to assess patients, but initially it had only been commissioned for three. Um, so, in order to set up our response, we increased our capacity to the use of all of the five rooms. Um, we increased the staffing um, and we had uh, two members of security to assist with every shift. Um, because one thing that we saw was, um, although numbers of referrals did go down slightly, the acuity of the patients um, increased as they were lacking the support that they would normally have, for example, from the community teams or seeing people face to face um, and having access to other patient support and um, charities that they go to or the day centers that um, that was taken uh, or they could not reach that. So we did see um, patients with um, with quite high levels of psychosis, people who hadn't been taking their medication um, and who deteriorated pretty quickly. So we did actually need um, support of extra staff and security. Um, I just wanted to mention that very quickly as the Nightingale Hospital, as Janet said, was built, um, our trust coped very quickly and within three weeks they opened a new centre to assess patients who were presenting with crisis. So not on the 136 or 135, but um, as an emergency. And this was all done to relieve the pressure on the local A&E so that psychiatric patients didn't go to A&E but came to, our, came to us. Um, so, and then within the unit, um, sorry, I've just realized that I didn't say next slide. 
so um, if I if we could go to the slide um, and then to the next one, please. Um, thank you. Um, so this was all done to direct patients from um, a &E. Next slide, please. Oops. <laughs> Um, well, I'm just hoping my explanation was really clear. You didn't need to see the slides, but I think they will be up um, on the website. So all of the staff, again, were trained in PPE by our infection, um, um, infection disease nurses. Um, we had a very good stock of PPE, including FFP, FFP3 masks, because they're needed to conduct CPR. Um, the staff were also assisted with giving, um, they could stay in hotels nearby so they didn't have to travel home and the car park was made free so that they didn't have to use public transport if they had their cars. Um, so again, as my colleague Mel mentioned, staff have made a lot of sacrifices and um, staying in hotels, not seeing their families. So um, I just wanted to thank all the staff of the Place of Safety and the MHK team for their hard work and dedication. Um, just other things, again, it was basics, but just having very clear um, information on how to put PPE on, how to take it off. And again, we had the reflective practice with our very experienced clinical psychologist to discuss um, um, how the team were feeling and that helped with the staff anxiety. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, it was quite difficult with, um, in terms of thinking of the segregation and, uh, of these patients because we did see a lot of patients with high, um, high levels of acuity who had, uh, who were in, they had, um, who lacked capacity and perhaps not necessarily understood the need to isolate. Um, so we had um, an excellent peer support worker who um, to try to keep things relational with our patients and to explain how um, you know the need for isolation um, we have found um, that really helpful um, if we had to use segregation so keep a patient in the in the room essentially um, we uh, the trust developed this restrictive practice in these circumstances very quickly um, so that we had a legal framework to use the segregation um, for protection of what people and others um, from COVID. If we felt that the patient had capacity but refusing to isolate, um, then um, the staff were advised to um, call the police and um, under the health, health protection coronavirus um, regulations. And lastly, again, um, our cleaning team worked really hard and all the rooms were deep cleaned um, when, once patients were assessed. So, that's all I'm going to say um, for now, but um, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, we have lots of questions, so I'm going to be quite speedy at trying to get through them. And if there are ones that I can answer, because I've obviously worked there and they're quite brief, um, I'm going to uh, answer them myself. Um, but this one's for Dominic. Um, when do you do the swab prior to admitting to the ward? But it says after admitting to the ward. So when, when do you do the swab? I suppose is the question. Dom, um, yeah. I think we, yeah. Um, I think um, there are lots of different opportunities to do the swab. Um, sometimes people are swabbed in A&E, um, particularly if they've had medical problems beforehand, like alcohol detox and things like this. Um, they might have had a swab there and then we'll just chase the result from, from the medical trust. Um, if they come through the mental health crisis assessment um, service um, that Senem touched on, um, then sometimes they're swabbed there. Um, if they haven't had a swab in, in A&E or, or MHCAS, um, then normally the admitting doctor would, um, would swab them as part of the clerking, you know, when you do the ECG and bloods, the physical exam. The swap will mm -hmm. be done then, um, yeah, and, and then hand over to the, the normal the wherever. Wherever. Yeah, exactly. So, whenever whenever we're able to do it at the earliest opportunity, yeah. yeah. Um, someone's asked, did you have the ward have to do facilities for ventilators? But we didn't have facilities for ventilators. But what we do have, and we are incredibly lucky that we have this... Uh, I mean, we're in a mental health hospital opposite the medical hospital. I mean, it's 
you know, it's five minutes walk or less. It's like a three minute run. So we are close enough. Um, so we've been very lucky about that. Um, Senem, how were you able to maintain safe distancing and appropriate ventilation in the rooms? Which is a good question. Um, in the place of safety or in the ward? Yeah, um, it's everywhere in the room. So that's a really good question. I think one of the things we did was minimize the number of staff going into the room. Um, and we had to be very meticulous with our donning of PPE. Um, we yeah. had, airing the room was, was difficult, but um, I mean, we do, there is ventilation of the rooms that's done in a safe and ligature free way. Uh, but the most important thing was to for the staff entering um, to yeah, keep it is a good the question because there's no windows or like I said yeah I think we just tried to keep to social distancing as best as we could and wear PPE and um, we were very careful if someone was um, symptomatic or positive for COVID-19 and um, someone's asked about testing all the patients and yes actually we test did the whole hospital but not the staff but we tested every single patient in the hospital um so that we knew and we had a, quite a few people who were completely asymptomatic and i often speak to my medical friends about how interesting it's been working on our ward because we've seen the complete range of covid19 positive patients because some people are completely asymptomatic and i remember people saying to me why am i in isolation i'm fine and i kind of agreed with them but sort of tried to explain about how contagious the virus was and um, this is a good question what was the rate of survival on the ward um we we everyone who came to our ward survived that's um dominic that's uh our experience but there were people who um came that were due to come to our ward but didn't um dominic do you remember the specifics i think there was um yeah there was one that um went to the the acute trust and sadly passed away um they would have come to us um had had an obvious fact that they were so uh, medically unwell um but no they, they obviously went straight to the acute trust we, we didn't have any deaths. Um, and this is a question for Janet. Who's, um, Janet, do you want to come into the screen as well? Oh, um, how were we managing Section 17 leave, especially unescorted leave during this time? Well, this was done in a stepwise manner because right at the beginning, um, everybody was in lockdown. And I mean, not just the ward, but all of us. Um, our patients were largely only with us for the seven days or the clinical length of time which they needed to isolate so there wasn't any um, opportunity to go outside we then uh, kept some patients as we were um, coming into the hybrid phase of our ward the gradual changing which happened over uh, two three weeks from being a covered ward to returning to being a triage ward we had um, some patients who were covered ne negative and had recovered so again um, it really is true that our executive led us on this again and we were i mean in discussion with us though we were given guidance so for example um patients who were going on section 17 leave they had to be able to com comply with whatever that week's government recommendations were and they had to have the capacity to do that and to make that decision um in, in informal patients we didn't have any informal patients who stayed with us beyond the length of time of their isolation but i know the questions about section 17 and as each stage has gone forward in the nation we've paralleled that and like accommodated the section 17 to take that into account Hopefully, okay, thank you. Um, this is would be good if Mel could answer this one, Senem. So it's um, I'm interested in the speakers. It's a great question. I'm interested in the speakers uncertain uh, experience of uncertainty, um, both clinical uncertainty and the possible sort of false negatives and the psychological effects of uncertainty in patients unsure of their situation and support. It's a great question because there was a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> Yes, um, I feel I could probably talk for about half an hour on that, but I won't. Um, 
I mean, I think I can just say uncertainty was a was a huge part of the anxiety that everyone felt. I think as soon as we had a clearer sense of what our patient group would look like, what our day to day life on the ward would look like, the logistical issues that we discussed at the beginning, I think as those became more clear, everyone's anxiety improved. Um, in terms of patient anxiety, I mean, I don't know what other people think. Interestingly, the patients that I saw on, on Sapphire Ward who were symptomatic or else had tested positive often weren't um, hugely anxious about it. We were often more anxious than they were. I think if people were asymptomatic, they were often just slightly frustrated that they were being asked to isolate. Um, and then the issue of false negatives. Yes, that's, a, that's been a challenge, I think, through all, all services everywhere. I mean, if someone had a routine swab, had no symptoms, a routine swab because they'd just come into hospital and, and tested negative, that was usually seen as sufficient. But if they were symptomatic in a way that made us think this is really typical of COVID, then we wouldn't take a negative swab to mean that, um, to mean that they didn't have it. We would usually swab again. Usually two negatives were fairly reliable. Um, and I guess the other thing that I, I should mention is the, the, the risk of diagnostic overshadowing. So just because someone's got a fever and cough doesn't mean they have COVID-19. So that was sometimes helpful to get a negative swab and say, well, hang on, are we missing something? Um, so I hope that answers the question, at least in part. Um, unfortunately, I can't hear your answer, but I'm hoping everyone else could hear it. Um, Dom, this is a question for you. What happens if a patient refuses to give a sample? Is there a legal process of enforcement? Good question. <laughs> oh, that's a very difficult question, though. Um, so um, I believe that um, we had a policy in place um, for people keeping people in their bedrooms um, when they didn't want to stay in um, as um, not seclusion but as segregation um, and that was under the Mental Capacity Act um, rather than the Mental Health Act. Um, yeah so if someone refused to swab um, and it was clear that we weren't going to get it we didn't um, we didn't try anything like restraining patients or anything like that we would um, keep it proportionate, um, try to get them to isolate them for the required period, um, and then, yeah, treat them in the same way as all the other patients. Um, there's lots of questions about what facilities we have, and just so that I can briefly answer them, um, we we got oxygen concentrators and we had those um you know the, the the cylinders as well but we didn't have the oxygen that can come from the piped oxygen that can come from the walls we didn't have access to ivs um i did end up doing a blood gas to get someone's blood sample which is the most technical thing i'd done in 10 years um but uh, we don't you know we're a psychiatric um, hospital so we've got no access to ivs um, and would transfer if that was necessary with regards to the level of ppe we wore and we were lucky our trust was really proactive we got scrubs straight away um and uh, they were provided so that every day new scrubs um we also had um, so aprons, um, visors that we should actually mention Loughborough University. And I've been meaning to tweet about and say thank you. Loughborough University provided us with the, you know, the kind of 3D printed visors, which were incredible. Because before that, I was wearing my glasses every day uh, because, you know, people were coughing into us, um, although we were maintaining social distancing where we could with them. And we also um, had gloves and really good masks as well. And now the trust has provided for public transport and just sort of going home um, washable masks masks as well which is great um mel i don't know whether you know this it's about they're asking about statistics of how many people were um tested how many people were positive um do you have any because we're writing this up actually for a paper um do you have any sense of, of the stats so at the moment unfortunately i don't those are, those are numbers that i've requested because they were all coded very carefully whenever anyone was swabbed whenever anyone was suspected tested positive or negative and i agree those numbers will be incredibly interesting once they're available but no i don't have them to hand at the moment okay 
Um, thank you. It's actually five o'clock. Um, there are a few questions that we haven't had a chance to answer, but what I'll do is um, I'll actually answer them on Twitter. So um, I'm at Doc, D-O-C, Golner, which is my first name. And um, I, any other, if you look up RC Psych, I'm tagged into their post. Um, I'm happy to answer any of the other questions as well. But thank you so much to the presenters. Um, thank you. Uh, what a wonderful team. It's been an absolute pleasure to work um, here. And someone asked, actually a good question, someone asked us, are we still a COVID-19 ward? And I'm, I'm happy to say we, we are not a COVID-19 ward. A couple of weeks ago, we slowly transitioned back to being um, an admissions ward, which um, we were all really excited about. Um, it means that there's no, there hasn't been any cases of COVID-19, I think for over 44 weeks in our hospital now. Um, and that kind of fits in with the rest of London but I know from my friends who work in the north that there's still um, ongoing COVID-19 up there but we are pleased to say we are back um, into being a uh, COVID um, free uh, hospital um, and may it stay that way. Um, please uh, do look up the webinar and also the link for our powerpoints which will all be available online and, and if you're interested in uh, there's any other questions that haven't been answered I'll be asked answering them all on Twitter. Um, thank you for joining everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>